This morning we're going to be looking at the very popular topic of suffering in the Christian life. It's just the next text as we come in the book of 1 Peter. You know, scripture is very clear in a very consistent and a very unified way that suffering is going to be part of the Christian's life. Uh, contra what you may hear on television from your TV preachers, contra what you may hear from books that you may find in the bestseller Christian list. Um, it should not surprise us that suffering is part of the Christian life. Jesus promises, promises us that this will happen. The word is clear from beginning to end that suffering is a normative part of the Christian life. You know, when we talk about suffering, before we get into our passage this morning, I think it's important for us to understand the variety of forms that suffering can take in our life. It may be helpful for us to think of three different aspects of suffering in the form of concentric circles. I'm going to put an image on the screen for you that hopefully may help you in this, if this will work. If not, you can just... There we go. All right, so the first one, this outside circle, this broadest uh, spectrum of suffering is what we'll call humiliation. So this sort of suffering occurs when maybe you get made fun of, ostracized, kicked out of the cool group, lose friends, lose family members maybe, whatever that may be, all for your allegiance to Christ. This is kind of where suffering starts and is what we'll call humiliation. The next circle is what we'll call intimidation. This is where suffering starts to get just a little bit stronger. This sort of suffering goes a bit further where maybe your job is in jeopardy. Uh, maybe you're limited to what you can and cannot say. Your freedom of speech or your freedom of religion may be impinged upon. It's a step further from humiliation, but not quite as far as the final circle, which we'll call persecution. This is the worst kind of suffering. This is the last form of suffering. This is where you may be imprisoned or killed for your devotion to Christ. So in the one, in the broad scheme of things, you may lose your status in the culture. In the next circle, you may lose your job. And in the next circle, you may lose your head. Right, so these are three different aspects to suffering. It's important for us to understand that all three of these are included when we talk about this word suffering, but not all necessarily at the same time. You know, it's, for instance, it's important for us to use the right language, maybe. I don't think that we in America yet should use this persecution language. I don't think we in America have tasted persecution in any way yet. Our lives are not in danger because we're gathered together right now. Our freedom is not endangered because we open our Bibles and preach the word of Christ. However, we certainly do see a movement, do we not, from this outside circle of humiliation to this middle circle of intimidation. We see as our culture is moving the direction it is, we start seeing some of these changes. But we have not yet come to that final stage. But, so think about all three of these forms of suffering as we talk about our passage this morning. Apply it to your life in whatever way you have experienced, but all three of these can be included when we speak of suffering. Now before we jump into our text, let's talk about where we've been, because it's been quite some time before, since we've been in the book of 1 Peter. You know, I was going back in my notes, and it's been two years and one month since we started in 1 Peter, since I preached the first 11 verses of 1 Peter, October of 2013. So it's kind of important for us to recap where we've been. So we've gone through three major sections. I don't know if this is going to work. Three major sections. The first section is in chapter 1, 1 through 2, 10. And this is where we saw that we are called to salvation as exiles. We are exiles in this world. We are exiles in this hostile for, foreign world. And this is the context into which we have been called to salvation. And then the next section that we spent some time in was Okay, how then do we live as exiles in this hostile world? And Peter applied uh, the general principle of, of living as exiles in a hostile world. He applied that to three spheres of our life, to our relationship to the government, our relationship in the workplace, and our relationship in the family amongst one another. And then last time, as we were in the book of 1 Peter, we started a new section that we just skipped. Can I just have you, yeah, I'm sorry, this thing's not working, I'm sorry. Just that last one. <laughs> sorry. So the, la the last section talks about how we can suffer 
in a godly way. And we looked last week at the verses of the end of chapter 3, verses 13 through 22, and we saw that suffering is a pathway to blessing, and Jesus is example number one in this, in this regard. So now we turn to the next passage in this section as we look at how we as Christians can suffer in a godly way. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 1 Peter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So before we start digging into our passage this morning, I want to give you the main point up front, and here's what it is. The main point we see in this passage is that we as Christians must arm ourselves like Christ for the suffering that is coming our way, for the inevitable suffering that is coming our way. Suffering in the Christian life is coming. Peter says in verse 1, arm yourselves. It's the only command given here in this passage. He says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking that Jesus had, arm yourselves to be ready to suffer. So that's the main point. If you hear nothing else this morning, that is the main point. Arm yourselves to suffer. But that's not it, right? That's easy to say, but how do we do that? That's easy to say, okay, I need to prepare myself to suffer. But how do we do that? How do we meet, get, let the rubber meet the road and really prepare to suffer? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of our time this morning. In this text, we're going to see that Peter gives us three gospel commitments that we must make, two personal cost that we must be ready to endure, and one encouraging reminder as we prepare to embrace suffering as an aspect of the Christian's calling. So let's get into our passage this morning. Three gospel commitments that we must be willing to make. The first one here is that we must become a person of resolve. We must become a person of resolve. Look at the first verse again in 1 Peter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. Let's pause right there because he's pointing us back here. Since, therefore, he's pointing us back to what he just said. In chapter 3, verse 18 through 22, he argued that the suffering of Christ was the pathway to his victory and exaltation. Therefore, just as Christ suffered in the flesh, we too must resolve to suffer. So since everything we talked about last time, everything I just talked about, Peter's saying, since all of that, since Christ suffered in this way, what are we to do? Look back at verse 1. Command, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Let's pause there before we finish the verse. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. We must become a person of resolve to prepare ourselves for suffering. It's not enough for us as Christians to sit idly back passively and say, you know what, I know suffering is going to come. Hopefully I'll make it through. Hopefully I'll keep my commitment to Christ. I know it's going to come. I'm just going to let it come my way. That's not enough. If you do that, you will cave. If you do that, you will give in. You will not persevere. Peter tells us, arm yourselves. Become a person of resolve, a person of discipline. This word here, this Greek word, arm yourselves, is the word aplizo, which doesn't really matter to you, but here's the important thing. It's the only time in the whole New Testament that this word is used. The only time in the whole New Testament this word is used, but it's used in outside Greek literature over and over, always in connection with military language. It's always used in connection with military language as soldiers and the military prepares to gird up, to train themselves for the, for the battle that is coming their way. It's a word that means to make ready or to equip. And so this military language Peter uses, when he's using this, he indicates that discipline and grit are involved in the Christian life in the, minds, in the midst of suffering. This is not a passive thing. This is an active thing, just like soldiers 
preparing for battle, we must gird up, train ourselves, get ready, equip ourselves for the suffering that is coming our way. So arm yourselves, equip yourselves with what? With the same way of thinking. Well, what is this way of thinking? What, what are we talking about? Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. It's the way of thinking that recognizes that suffering is expected and normative in the Christian life and is often the pathway to God's blessing. Listen, Peter was not teaching anything new to these readers. He was not teaching some new concept that they would have never heard. I have a few verses up on the screen. Jesus taught it positively in Luke 9, 23. He says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You know, we tend oftentimes to, um, to kind of explain that, to, to symbolize that, the cross. We, we must take up the burdens of life. And that's true. That, that, that's very well and good. But the people that Jesus is talking to, they understood what the cross was. They understood what it meant to take up the cross and follow him. This was a call to suffer. This was a call to suffer in the worst way possible for the sake of Christ. And he says it another way in Matthew 10, 38 through 39. He says, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his, his life for my sake will find it. And these are just two verses throughout the Gospels we could go over and over and over, showing that Jesus prepared his disciples to suffer for the Christian life. Paul also understood cross-bearing very well. He understood suffering all too well. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 12, this is what he says. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So Jesus taught it to his disciples. He prepared them for it. Paul talks about his experiences of suffering. And then martyrs throughout church history have been willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. The author of Hebrews tells us of a few of these. In Hebrews 11, 35 through 38, if you'll put that on the screen. He says, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Why? Why were they willing to do this? Why were they willing to endure all of this stuff? Why was Paul willing to endure what he calls the death of Christ in his body? Why were they willing to endure this? Because they armed themselves with the same way of thinking that Jesus had. They prepared themselves with the same way of thinking that Jesus had, that they were going to be faithful to the Father no matter the cost to their lives. They understood that the cross precedes the crown. The cross, the willingness to endure suffering precedes the crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life that we will receive. As we prepare to embrace this aspect of suffering in the Christian life, we have to be willing to do what Peter tells us to do, which is arm yourselves, prepare yourselves, get ready for the suffering that is coming. And that happens by thinking clearly. So, number two. Live for the will of God. The second gospel commitment we must be willing to make in addition to becoming a person of resolve is to live for the will of God. Continue with me in verse 1 into verse 2. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. The point in this verse is that Christians... As Christians prepare for suffering, we must be willing to commit to live for the will of God in our life. Now, we need to ask an important question about this verse. I don't know if you caught it as we were reading it, but there's a hard-to-understand phrase here that we need to address. He says, at the end of verse 1, look at that with me again. He says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What in the world does that mean? You suffered in the flesh, you ceased from sin. We don't have time to get into all the intricacies and the different options, but let me tell you, we can say unashamedly at, at first that he is not teaching any sort of perfection in the Christian life. 
He's not teaching any kind of perfection that a Christian can actually come in this life to a point where he is sinless, to a point where he is free of sin. It is, doesn't go with the rest of Scripture. He's not teaching what is called Christian perfectionism, that Methodists, Wesleyans, and some in the holy, holiness movement, like Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, these kind of people, they are teaching this doctrine, Christian perfectionism, which is the teaching that Christians can actually be freed from original sin and so indwelt by the Holy Spirit and guided by God that they no longer sin in this life. That's not what Peter is teaching. It doesn't accord with the rest of Scripture. We could go on and on about how this does not accord with the rest of Scripture, but it doesn't accord with Paul and, and Paul's admission of his sin and imperfection, his documenting of that ongoing struggle in Romans 7. It doesn't accord with Peter, James, and John all admitting their faults and their imperfections and their sin. And their sin. How could we claim anything different? That is the height of, of pride, in my opinion. Perfection for the Christian life will not come until glorification, until we are united with Christ after our death. So if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? Well, we could give a few different options that I think all, are all legitimate and we could believe and be faithful to the rest of Scripture, but I just don't think they make sense of the rest of the passage. One very popular one I just want to address is to say that the whoever has suffered here is talking about martyrs who have died for their faith. So this, this understanding would would have Peter say, whoever has suffered in the flesh, that means whoever has died for the cause of Christ, has ceased from sin in the sense that, well, now they're dead and they're united with Christ, and so they're not sinful anymore. There's nothing wrong with that teaching, right? It accords with the rest of Scripture. I just don't think it's what Peter is teaching here. Why? Because he goes on in verse 2, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh. Whoever he's talking about here, whoever has suffered in the flesh, whoever he's talking about is still alive, it seems like. They've still got time in the flesh left to live. So what does it mean? I think that Peter's saying this. Their commitment to suffer, your commitment to suffer, your commitment to suffer in the flesh is evidence that you have broken with a life dominated of sin. The point then is not that believers attain some kind of sinless perfection, as if they don't sin at all after their suffering, what he's emphasizing is that those who commit themselves to suffering, those who commit themselves to endure the scorn and mockery for their faith, show that they have triumphed over sin. The commitment to suffer reveals a passion for a new way of life, one that's not dominated by an old way of life and sin, but one that is dominated by an obedience to the will of God. As one commentator said, those who suffer for the gospel do by their very willingness demonstrate that they are done with sin. Not in a perfect way, but just in a characteristic way. Their life is not characterized by being dominated by sin, but is characterized by being dominated by obedience to the will of God. So what is the point? How does this fit in with us being resolved to live for the will of God? We said we have to make three gospel commitments. First, we have to become a person of resolve, and secondly, we need to live for the will of God. And as we live for the will of God, we so show that our uh, allegiance and obedience is to Christ, not to others. We so show that our allegiance is to the will of God and not our own will. Because if we followed our own will, we would avoid suffering, right? Because we wouldn't come at odds with the culture very much. We wouldn't rub the wrong way with the culture very much, but as we follow the will of God, we so show that we are done with that life dominated by personal preference and sin, and we are dominated by an obedience to the will of Christ, and we live for the will of God. The third commitment is closely, closely related to this, if you put it on the screen, it's to leave human passions behind. We're going to see this in verse 3. Look at verse 3 again with me. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And then he gives a list of these things. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. He's simply reiterating the point he just gave in verse 2, right? He's just showing the flip side of it. You really see the comparison in the Greek because right here at verse 2, the will of God... Uh, they no longer live for human passions, but for the will of God. If you fast forward into verse 3, for the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, that phrase there is literally just doing the will of the Gentiles. So you very clearly see here two different wills 
compared and contrasted to one another. The will of God that looks like this and the will of the Gentiles or the will of the world that looks like this. That's what he means there when he refers to the Gentiles, not just a particular group of people, but the unbelieving world. So you see two different wills compared here. And what does he say about this? He says, the time that has passed suffices. That's just fancy language to say, quit it, right? That, be done with that. Grow up be mature, be done with that old way of life. Turn to Christ and your obedience to God, not to the way of the world and the way of your own sinful, selfish desires. You see, life is an ongoing fraternity party, which is basically what this list describes, right? Is a major problem in the church today. If we aren't there in person doing these things, we are all too present through what we watch on TV see in the theaters or watch on the internet. We may le- read a verse like this. I think all, many of us are tempted to and say, whew, I'm, I'm good. I'm not doing any of that. But we, I think we have to go a step further and ask ourselves, but are you entertained by it? In your entertainment, are you watching others do this list of things and finding entertainment in that? Peter is emphatically declaring enough already. That, that time is the time that has passed suffices for doing that. Be done with that. Turn to Christ and prepare yourself to suffer. You see, it is a disastrous thing for Christians to not put to death the desires of the flesh, to fail to leave behind the old way of life. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this guy, Soren Kierkegaard. He's an old Danish philosopher whom we certainly would not agree on everything, maybe not many things. But he gives a great example of what this looks like. That is, is a disastrous thing not to leave our old way of life behind. He gives a story. One springtime, a duck was flying with his friends northward across Europe. During the flight, he came down in a barnyard where there were tame ducks. He enjoyed some of their corn. He stayed for an hour and then for a day. One week passed, and before he knew it, a month had gone by. He loved the good food, so he stayed all summer long. One autumn day, when the wild ducks... When the same wild ducks were winging their way southward again, they passed overhead, and the duck on the ground heard their cries. He was filled with a strange thrill and joy, and he desired to fly with them once again. With a great flapping of his wings, he rose in the air to rejoin his old comrades in flight. But he quickly found out that his good fare had made him so soft and heavy that he could not rise higher than the eaves of the barn. He dropped back again into the barnyard and said to himself, Oh well, my life is safe here, and the food is good. Every spring and autumn, when he heard the wild ducks honking, his eyes would gleam for a moment and he would begin flapping his wings. But finally the day came when the wild ducks flew overhead, uttering their cries, but he paid no attention at all. In fact, he failed to hear them at all. As Christians, we have become like this duck far too often. We have feasted for far too long on the pleasant fare that the world has to offer. And what that causes us to do is to way too easily forget that the time that was passed was enough for that. We forget that we are still far from home, that we are far from home where God would have us be. And so sadly, many of us go day by day unfazed by gospel truths we're reminded of because we're so feeding on the things of this world that we think too little of the delights of heaven that await us. Peter says to us very clearly, enough, enough. Be done with that. Turn to Christ. So if we are to be men and women of God who prepare and arm ourselves to suffer, we have to make these three commitments. Become a person of resolve, live for the will of God, and leave human passions behind. But those things don't come without a cost, do they? When you start doing these three things in your life, they do not come without a cost, which leads us to our next, our next verse. If you put that on the screen, two personal costs. The first one, humiliation. Let's look, and we're going, we're using this language to go with our circles that we talked about at the beginning. So look at verse four. So he just gave this list of things that the Gentiles do, and he says the time time that has passed suffices for that. And then verse 4, with respect to this, pointing back to that list, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So number one, surprise, humiliation. They're surprised when you don't join them. 
Let me tell you, when you begin to make these commitments, when you begin to put that old way of life to the side, when you begin to say no to seeing that movie, to say no to going to that party or event, to say no to parenting in the way that the world tells you to parent, to say no to hoarding all of your money just for yourself and spend it on your pleasure and to get this big pile of money for you to enjoy, when you begin to say no to all of those things, you're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be misunderstood for, by the word. Why? Because they have no categories by which to understand it. They have no categories to understand why you would no longer grab all you can for yourself without regard for the next world. They have no categories for understanding that. So the first step is they're surprised at it. You're misunderstood. And oftentimes this misunderstanding leads to humiliation. It doesn't just stop there like, whoa, I can't believe he's doing that. It often turns to whoa, I can't believe he's doing that and he's really weird. And now I don't want him to be part of our group anymore because he makes me feel bad. And he makes me feel bad that I'm doing these things. And so you see this progression happening that as you begin to make these gospel commitments to be allegiant to Christ, the honor and respect and social position that you had in the world among your friends begins to crumble. It may not happen at first. It may happen over months or even years. But you begin to be called things like holier than thou too good for us, Many good, miss goody two-shoes, right? You begin to be called these things because you have an allegiance to Christ that is far above your allegiance to your friends or your allegiance to this world. You have to be willing to embrace that. Now, it starts with surprise, but then the next one is intimidation, or as the language says in the text, they malign you. So they're surprised when you don't join them, but they don't just stop there. They malign you. This word malign very interesting. It's the Greek word blasphemos, which is the word that's translating blaspheme all throughout the rest of the New Testament. So literally, they're going to blaspheme your name. They're going to slander you. They're going to speak evil of you. They're going to defame you. Surprise evokes misunderstanding, and misunderstanding evokes a sense of being judged. You're making me feel bad for what I'm doing. And when they feel judged, what often happens? They lash back. They malign you. They talk bad about you. This is that second circle we were talking about. R.C. Sproul tells of a time when Billy Graham was invited to play golf with President Ford and two PGA professionals. After the round of golf was finished, another golf pro came up and asked the one who was playing with the president and Graham and asked, hey, what was it like playing with the president and with Billy Graham? Uh, the golfer unleashed a string of curse words in a very disgusting manner. I don't need Billy Graham stuffing religion down my throat all the time. And with that, he stor turned, stormed off, and headed to the practice tee. His friend was smart and just kind of sat back and let the guy vent a little bit. After a few minutes, the golfer's anger settled down, so his friend asked him, so was Billy rough on you, a little rough on you out there? The pro heaved an embarrassing sigh and said, no, he didn't even mention religion. I just had a bad round. Sproul comments on this. He says, astonishing. Billy Graham is so identified with religion, so associated with the things of God, that his very presence is enough to smother the wicked man who flees when no man pursues. Luther was right. The pagan does tremble at the rustling of a leaf. He feels the hound of heaven breathing down his neck. He feels crowded by holiness, even if it's only made present by an imperfect, partially sanctified human vessel. Whether you be like Billy Graham in this story where you are just so associated with the things of God and holiness that you are maligned or whether you're outspoken with your friends, family, co-workers, whoever it may be regarding your views on a whole host of things, whether it be abortion or marriage, holiness or your obedience to Christ, the fact is the same. Obedience to God it will yield slander from the world. And let me tell you, before we move on to our last point, in this culture that we live in today, it's only going to get worse. It is only going to get worse. There are a whole array of things that we could talk about. We could spend the, uh, another hour talking about a whole array of things of where it's going to get worse. But I think the most obvious one is the sexual revolution that we see happening in our world today. In an increasing way, if you are a Christian committed to the sanctity of life or the biblical view of marriage between one man and one woman, you are going to be strange, but you're not just going to be strange and surprise people. They will malign you. They will slander you. They will make fun of you. You may lose your job. You may be completely socially ostracized, and it's only going to increase. You must be ready for it. You must be ready for it. This 
is the exact situation that Peter, Peter's readers found themselves in. There's little, I think we often fail to realize this, there's little to no evidence that Peter's readers were actually facing any kind of systematic governmental persecution at this time. There's little to no evidence. Uh, they weren't facing uh, imprisonment, physical deprivation, torture, execution. They weren't facing any of that. What they were facing was social ostracization. I don't even know how to say that word. But they were being socially ostracized, I can say that. But we must not overlook the fact that this criticism often leads to more severe action, that sharp words can easily and quickly turn into sharp swords. See, Revelation was written just 30 years later. 30 years later, around AD 95, 30 years after this letter was written by Peter, and it's evident in Asia Minor at that time that some believers were losing their lives for their devotion to Christ. When Peter was written, they weren't yet that severe, but what did he do? He wrote to his readers and said, you better prepare for it. You better arm yourselves for the suffering that is coming. So it is for us. We find ourselves in a very similar cultural scenario as Peter's readers did. And we have to be willing to take seriously our obedience to God and becoming social outcasts and be ready for that suffering. Will more come? Maybe. Will it get so severe that it leads to loss of employment, imprisonment, or death? I don't know, and you don't know either. Only the Lord knows. But what I do know is that we better heed the words of Peter here in this passage. Arm yourselves for it, because it's going to come at one time or another. But Peter doesn't leave it there. He gives us three commitments to make, two two personal uh, calls that we have to be willing to endure, but then he ends here with one encouraging reminder. If you'll put that up there. One encouraging reminder. He, here's what he tells us, and then we're going to read verses 5 through 6. Present circumstances are not the last word. God will right all wrong. He will punish all sin, and he will make all things right as a just and good judge. He ends here with a very encouraging reminder to us. Read verse 5 and 6 with me. So after he talks about them being surprised and maligning you, he says, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And let's pause there before we look at verse 6. So he's basically saying, God's going to make it all right. Don't worry, just persevere. Hang in there because God is going to make it all right. Listen, we must understand that every single sin that you or I ever commit will be paid for one day. It will either be paid for by yourself on the day of judgment or it will be paid for by the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ on your behalf. But no sin will go unpunished. Every single sin that's ever committed in this world will go punished, either by you or by Christ. If you are trusting in yourself and trusting in your own good to make yourself right with God, you will pay for that sin on judgment day. Not just those that that are maligning these believers, as we see here in this text, but every single person in this world will pay for their sin if they're trusting in themselves, but it does not have to be that way. God has made a way of salvation through Christ. Jesus lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, and he died the perfect death that we don't have to die, so that if we would turn to him, turn away from our sin, and turn to Christ, we would have the penalty of our sin paid for by him, not for ourse by ourselves on judgment day. Peter gives us this reminder here. God will right all wrongs, he will take care of the unbelieving world. And then he ends here in verse 6, so we have to address this so that uh, you're, not, you're not misunderstood by it or misunderstand it. Verse 6, For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who were dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. What in the world does that mean? Well, we, again, we don't have time to go into all of it, but let me tell you what it clearly does not mean. That phrase was preached even to those who were dead, it clearly does not mean preaching the gospel to those who have died in any way, whether it be a few different options, whether it be preaching the gospel to Old Testament believers who died before Christ, whether it be preaching the gospel to those who are dead because they never heard the gospel in this life, or whether it be preaching the gospel to everyone who dies and giving them a second chance. All three of these are views that are espoused from this verse, and it can't mean any of them. Any any understanding that includes a second chance after death has to be immediately reje rejected because it goes against everything else in the rest of Scripture. So what does it mean? Peter is referring to the gospel being preached to those who are now dead, 
though they were alive when the gospel was preached. You see, what was happening was unbelievers, just like they may do to you today, just like they do in our world, unbelievers were using the death of believers as evidence that it doesn't really matter if you believe in this gospel thing, if you believe in Christianity, you're going to die the same way we all die. So they were using that as an argument against Christianity. And Peter says, whoa, 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 yes, they do die. Look at the phrase. They do that. They're, they're, they're judged in the flesh the way people are. That means they die. They, they suffer the judgment of sin and death. Yes, they die, but they live in the spirit the way God does. Peter says, that's not it. Their physical death in this world is not the end of it. If it was, you'd be exactly right. There would be no, no, really no reason. I mean, no advantage. They die just like you do. But Peter says, that's not it. You're forgetting the life after death. You're forgetting the judgment that is to come. And that's what we're going to look at more as we come to the next passage. Next time I am able to preach, he turns to that subject a little more. But he ends here saying, death is not the final word. Death is not the final word. There's something else to look forward to. Commit to Christ, endure that suffering, arm yourselves to get ready, and commit to Christ above all else. He calls us here in this passage to endure, to make commitments that lead us to suffer well, to endure the costs that come with that, and to remember the comfort that God gives us. He calls us to endure, to persevere, and to hold fast to Christ above all else. Let's pray together.